haven't seen shots today. So, I guess we're about there. Yeah. Better get going so that we can get finished in time for a lunch. <laughs> so, this is uh, our talk about uh, how our company does. Uh, distributed working. Uh, it's it's in the business track, so I won't really be talking about the some of the technical aspects of uh, how we handle uh, deployment and code versioning and so on. Uh, so really, just be talking about you know the, the tools we use for working and communicating. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, I'm Steve Kelly from Code Enigma, and our company is entirely distributed. We have uh, no office <coughs> premises at all, and uh, we're spread uh, but far and wide. Uh, I'll explain why we do that, uh, talk a bit about how we go about doing it, some of the tools, uh, and probably the most interesting bit is how it actually works or doesn't work for us. So, this is our uh, where are we distributed currently? Uh, we have uh, half a person in Australia. That's the most uh, most distributed. Uh, yeah, um, technically speaking, uh, it's a guy called uh, Mig. Um, you probably know uh, he's Mig Five. He uh, worked on the Agar uh, uh, system. He's a fantastic system administrator, so from our point of view, it helps us out with that so that we can have 24 hour cover. Uh, the rest of us are all across the UK, Northern Ireland, Wales, uh, England. We currently have nobody in Scotland, which is a bit of a disgrace, but uh, I might move to rectify that. And actually, strictly speaking, we only have one person in Spain, but we have one Spanish employee who lives in Walthamstow and spends every day of life trying to figure out why do I live in Walthamstow when I could be living in Madrid. Uh, so, why do we do it? Well, I'd like to say that we did an in-depth analysis of the economics of it and psychometric testing and worked out that this was definitely the best model. But that would be a lie. Basically, we did it because we formed by merging a number of Drupal companies and nobody wanted to move. So everybody stayed where they were. So one of the directors lives in France, and uh, I live in Leeds, and we couldn't convince them to leave the south of France and come to Leeds. I don't understand why. Uh, there are some cost benefits to this. Uh, I had uh, I ran just out of curiosity because we are we're London based in the sense that a lot of our work derives through London. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll try to figure out roughly what it would cost to have an office. Uh, now I don't know how accurate these testers are, but it's a good old chunk of money that we don't spend. Uh, but on the other hand, we do have. Uh, quite a number of other costs to offset against that. So we pay for a percentage of people's uh, heating and lighting bills because they're working at home. Uh, we pay for the broadband. Uh, people have a personal development budget, although they'd have that if they were in uh, an office as well. International payroll is uh, quite a substantial expense. 
Uh, my advice would be never hire anybody from France. <laughs> they cost 50% more than the same person in the UK. Uh, so uh, they also have all kinds of fantastic social provision and they're unfireable. <laughs> and my second bit of advice would be never hire anybody from Spain. <laughs> they don't cost quite as much as people from France, but the bureaucratic system involved in hiring somebody from Spain uh, will probably turn your hair grey. Uh, we also have the expense of uh, company get-togethers. Although they were completely distributed, people do need to meet up from time to time. So currently we meet up at least uh, twice, twice a year. Uh, and uh, last time we met uh, in Cardiff in the summer, we'll meet in France, because uh, it's nicer than Cardiff. <laughs> uh, so there are costs. But the main point in the why for us is the caliber of staff that you can get. So if you're working in the UK uh, and you are engaged in uh, big, uh, what people might describe as enterprise level Drupal projects, it's very likely you will be working with clients uh, who have, where you're sourcing the clients in London and you're working with uh, clients uh, uh, who are London based and uh, if you're going to try and set up a Drupal company in London it's going to cost you an absolute <coughs> fortune uh, because Drupal developers are in demand and actually securing the people of the quality you need is going to be tricky whereas uh, one of our top developers lives in Preston I mean, if you've got a job in Preston <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, means that we can basically get people we can, really good people we can afford and frankly it's because they will work for less money because if you it takes a pay cut to get you to Preston then that's what people are willing to do uh, but it, it, they're making a choice about the life they want to have so I asked uh, the team to give me some of the you know, reasons why they think they do this, rather than why the company does it. Talked about work-life balance. Uh, the company has costs, but they can reduce costs because they don't have travel costs, which is good. Uh, less distractions <coughs> when they're not in an office. Uh, I mean, I've worked at home for, uh, for over 10 years now, and periodically I find myself in an office but I can't talk to anybody because I don't watch television. So <laughs> there is nothing for me to talk to the, the rest of the people in the office about. So we don't have those distractions. And they talked about having flexibility of the sh schedule when projects allow. So we can move things, we can move things around. Uh, some more benefits for them is they can move house or they can move country and stay with the same company. Uh, I hope to God they don't all move from England to France, but uh, <laughs> we think we can call for the model. Uh, they can set up how they, they want to work at home. Uh, so one guy uh, has he's, he's got an electric desk that goes up and down so he can stand up when he's designing and sit down when he's developing. Lunch options are nicer at home. Not in my house. <laughs> uh, distributed working. Uh, this last one, uh, this is what one of the team said, uh, so he feels like essentially he's a self-managing person at home to a considerable extent, so he is becoming uh, a better professional. Uh, so how, how do we go about doing it in terms of some of the tools? Uh, IRC is absolutely key for us, so everybody knows what IRC is, but bit of visual aid. So we basically sit in there all day. Uh, so at nine o'clock, people turn up. Uh, nobody ever turns up late. 
except <laughs> Matt Fielding. <laughs> we also, with the IRC, uh, we've got it. We've got our own IRC server, uh, which is running. So it's in a protected environment. <coughs> we wouldn't want to embarrass our clients by all the nice things we say about them. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in there. We also, uh, weirdly, we log it all. This is being done by <coughs> the the bot module. Is basically sitting in IRC with us and capturing everything that's going on. Uh, so. Uh, really helpful for being able to actually uh, uh, keep track and go back later on. If only Richard Nixon had done one of these. Still there. Uh, we, uh, we've got a VoIP network uh, specifically mentioned because we've tried a few and found them, uh, a couple of different systems found them flaky, but OrbTalk's the one we use that works. Uh, so we have conference systems on there. And of course it means that wherever people are, they can always just be on the VoIP. So if they go over to the States or Australia or whatever, they can still just use the same uh, telephone system. Uh, in terms of tracking what we do <coughs> day to day, uh, we use Redmine uh, as the, the tracker. Uh, we hate it, but we hate all trackers. <laughs> uh, we just hate it less than Jira or whichever. So, uh, we, we've also got it integrated uh, with uh, another tool that uh, basically gives us good metrics on Scrum, so that, that's the Redmine stuff and we customised it to track uh, things like whether a story is an MVP and so on. Uh, so uh, Google Docs is absolutely core for what we do. Uh, we've tried various systems uh, and thrown them out. Tried using things like Dropbox. Tried using Alfresco. Not pleasant experience. So the kind of communication you could just get by if you were all in the same space. Uh, we have an intranet. I'd show you a picture, except we haven't built the intranet quite yet. But I'm sure we'll get to it soon. Basically, what we need it for is to keep a history of what's going on, because we're a Drupal company, so we never document anything. <laughs> um, and we, we lose track of the history. So we need to be able to swap out developers. They have to be able to drop in a project. And the main thing about the internet will be actually basically so that you can find out what we're doing. Because you can't just turn around to somebody in the office. You don't know who does things. Uh, Google Hangouts uh, are uh, probably they, they really changed the way we work a lot. So that one's just for James. Uh, James Benson, this, this is our team down the bottom. Uh, and uh, we, we use Google Hangouts to you know, do a lot of our meetings now. Uh, basically, it's amazingly, it's free, it works well, it works a lot better. I mean, if you've got Skype on your computer, it just kills it. Google Hangouts works well. Uh, and what's also interesting about it is that people do really value being able to see each other. It's quite strange, because if you think about what usually happens in a Google Hangout, you log in, you go, hmm, and then you start looking at a document together. You're not even looking at each other. But by preference, people always use it over the telephone. Clients seem to like it as well. And it's reassuring that the fact that you're distributed really doesn't matter. Uh, so in terms of the process of how we work, we start every day in the morning scrum, then after that the project managers meet every day and go through all the projects. We meet twice a week as the whole team, uh, so we have one kind of like formal agenda meeting and another one where we just turn up and moan. Uh, there are individual project scrums going on all the time. There's a sales group. We have these, I said, twice a year, we're hoping that we'll have a quarterly meetup and we get it working. Uh, and uh, developers uh, work in at least pairs. Uh, I put pair programming on there, not frankly, to be honest, that we really do it at the moment, but we really would like to build it into our system. There are ways that you can do it perfectly effectively while not being in the same physical space. Uh, but 
uh, one of the important things we've learned is that if you just leave a developer on their own on a project working remotely, the project will definitely go off the rails. It's just not a good way to work. You've got to get two people on that so they can help each other, keep each other going. The thing that strikes me about all that, the reason why I listened to it, is that it's actually a very structured way of working. Uh, it's, we, you know, it's pretty rigid. And when it gets slack, people ask for it to be, let's make it more rigid. Let's get more systems in place. Let's tighten this up. So, turning to how well it actually uh, uh, works for us, uh, points I've just made. The structure really matters, uh, and uh, as we've gone on, we've just put more and more structure into what we do. So, just again, that's just like the name list that just struck me as an example. Everybody in this office, they tell me <coughs> when they've gone out for lunch. Uh, so, uh, just thought, well, this is really quite unusual. You know, you'd think we're all working on it. We can be really relaxed. We can go and do what we want. No, you can't. About five minutes after you disappear, Greg Harvey is looking for you for something. <laughs> uh, but the other point about it is, it's courtesy. Because the thing about actually not being in the same space is you've got to communicate. I kind of think sometimes it's a bit like, when you're acting, you have to slow it down and project it out so that people can get it. Same kind of community. You've got to think quite consciously, I need to tell people I'm not, I'm not here. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, we've also, I'm not going to go into heavily into the detail of this, uh, we've really adopted a very... Uh, uh, firm adherence to Agile and uh, we really do Agile uh, in the sense that most uh, clients we've come across said oh yeah Agile that's great uh, what they mean is well we don't have to pay for half of what you do and it'll all get done really quickly no we mean the whole thing so much so that we've uh, got herself ISO certified and our ISO certification is all based on how we actually uh, apply uh, Agile uh, and there's no, there's no secret to any of this so if people are interested in uh, seeing parts of the man basically the way the ISO system works is you basically create a quality manual of your quality systems so that you can record everything you do and measure them against that manual. Uh, and uh, if people want to get a look at bits of the <coughs> manual, that's fine. You can just, just email me and we will uh, let people have a look. Uh, so we have a system that uh, is very explicit about how we go about doing everything. To be honest, we don't always do it properly. Uh, so when I say we do Agile, we set out to try and do it. So, in terms of how it works for uh, the company, in terms of what are some of the issues and the, ne and the negatives, isolation is, as you would expect, a consideration. Uh, there's two sides to isolation. If everybody's spread out, there's a company side to it, so we don't have a water cooler. Uh, so, uh, we don't, in principle, have any opportunities to kind of... Uh, uh, share ideas, but as you saw before, we have an awful lot of communication channels uh, for addressing that. So to be honest, we don't, we don't really think it's a problem. From an individual point of view, uh, it can be a problem, because you're stuck on your own. You can, you can go crazy being uh, uh, stuck on your own, res wrestling with code problems. Uh, so how do we go about trying to address that? Well, if you're going to run a distributed company, your hiring uh, has got to be, uh, uh, is going to be pretty key because it's not going to work for absolutely everybody. Uh, there are certain people are going, it's going to work well. I mean, one of the things I note about our company is that it's been formed by several other companies merging. So all, almost, uh, two-thirds of the company are people who have run companies. 
And if you're running a company, generally speaking, you've, uh, you've got to be communicative, because if you aren't communicative, you can't sell anything. So our team uh, are very customer oriented. Uh, so if we had a developer, for example, who wanted to just get their head down, now that might be really useful in certain situations, they might not fit that well with what we do. Uh, so we would want to know, for example, do they experience what's going on at home? The home circumstances, that's health and safety warning. Think about it as an employer, you're responsible for how they work. So you're going to have to actually check out what the home environment is like, where they're working. In France, of course, they have this covered. There's an annual visit to the, a doctor, oh, which we pay for. Uh, <laughs> What's the motivation for do what's their motivation for doing this? If we, uh, if it fits really well with their work-life balance, then the chances are we will hire them and they will stay. So uh, we're not going to discriminate against anyone. But people who've got families and they would like to be close to their family is would be a really good thing for uh, for hiring in, in our case. Uh, and if, yeah, they may have a career, if they've got a career plan that says, I want to make a shed a load of money uh, and move, uh, move, it may not work that well. Uh, what's their social skills? This is Drupal social skills. Who could, who could mention these things in the same breath? But you do need uh, a certain kind of uh, sociability. If you don't necessarily doesn't mean that people don't have it, but if they couldn't develop it, it could be problematic. That could be problematic. So one of our developers, uh, Dan, uh, wrote a really nice blog a couple of weeks ago about how he'd sort of got isolated working from home to a point where he felt communication skills were really suffering and uh, working uh, in the way we work has uh, really helped to change that. So you're going to have to invest in this. So, yeah, certainly kind of trying to think, how could you spot the developer you don't want? So I've come up with the concept of the syllogistical developer. So, syllogism being that. These are the people you probably don't want to hire. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they may actually, there may be people like this who are fantastic. Oh, nobody's going to mention chicks, but oh, if they did, they, they may be a genius. It just may not work that well with uh, the distributed model. So you need people in terms of how would you find this out? Well, are they capable of saying, oh, I don't know how you do that? Some developers are, some aren't. We need the people who are ready to say, whoa, I don't know, help. People who want to work collaboratively. In the Drupal world, Drupal is, I think, unusual uh, compared to a lot of projects. In just how many people are ready to get together and communicate. So these are characteristic of uh, <clears throat> people you want. Will they get what your company culture is? Which means, oh God, you'll have to think about what the company culture is, which is like, uh, so it feels almost un-British to be doing that. But uh, one of the things that I really notice about our senior developers is they're incredibly willing to help junior developers. That's a pretty good benchmark for uh, whether you've got the right people. Also, because we're working in Drupal, do they get the point about contributing to Drupal? Or would they rather have the money in their bonus? So our team, everybody in the contract got a month to work on their own labs projects, and everybody voted to give up two weeks of the month to do <coughs> Drupal contrib instead, because they'd rather spend the time uh, in Drupal. So they're actually making a commitment where they could be having the money. Uh, you need to uh, support and develop people. So a few things here uh, that we do. Uh, we have this concept of the buddy system, which is everybody in the company means that everybody has a sense of responsibility and management for other people. So. Uh, you need to make sure people, are, which we point out before, are not working alone. Think about alternating the roles so that people aren't stuck doing the same thing all the time. So, if you've got a team where people can, they could switch, for example, from being 
uh, developers to in uh, Agile being uh, the scrum master for a project. We also have the concept of a project mentor there to uh, work with the client. They could take over that role, so they could move through different roles. Uh, <coughs> we've uh, got now got staff reviews that we're starting to put in place because we thought oh, we don't need staff reviews. We're nice people, but people, staff said no. We want staff reviews. Uh, we need that formal opportunity to tell the company what we need, what we think, and uh, make sure that people are client facing. So every one of our uh, team, we will push them out in front of the clients. If they're not going to be able to do that, they probably aren't going to work that well in our model. Uh, and as one of the uh, team put it, oddly, in terms of like working in a distributed way, it's not so you can go surfing. Uh, it's you just want to turn up at a decent time, finish at a decent time, and do good work. Uh, and if the company can <coughs> set that up, job done. That's it. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. I've been working remotely for a couple of months and um, I really liked the way I could find uh, a like, co-working office. Uh, do you have a plan for your employees? Do you help them? Um... Yeah, so, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's come up for us recently that, 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 and what we did decide was that if, if people did want to, we have this uh, development budget and if people wanted to use it, use it and say, well actually I want to periodically go and co-work in, in a co-working space, uh, yeah, then we would uh, yeah, we'd definitely support and encourage it. We've also talked about uh, putting the money up so that if people want to actually go to where one of their colleagues is and travel and stay there because they want to just work together, because sometimes that is just a good thing to be doing, then yeah, we'll will cover the cost of that as well. Yeah. In terms of hardware, do you have a budget put aside to give your employees computers or did you expect them to bring their own laptop? Uh, no, no, we've, uh, we have a, a budget. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't even remember how much money it is. 2K every two years. 2K every two years, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so every two, every two years, people are, uh, yeah. Yeah, they get that they get that budget, and they have a thousand pounds a year for develop, you know, for personal development as well. So some people use the budget for things like furniture or, or modifications as well. So uh, yeah, they can mix that mix that up. Yeah. I was just wondering how you square having a nine o'clock start across the team with having an employee in Australia, and if you consider that going forward. Well, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. He's he doesn't take part. Uh, he is actually uh, he's a he's freelance. He's not an employee of ours. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the yeah there would be a point where yeah that that would be an issue, and we would I guess what we would probably uh, in terms of scaling, I think that the model you would probably there would be a point where you would have to not centralise it so much. So you might uh, drift off particular units. So for us that might be we're starting this fresh bridge hosting thing, and that might shift across and become its own thing. So I could see that what you would potentially have to do because of time issues uh, is either you'd have to set up a unit in Australia or you can work with a system administrator who never sleeps. And as far as I can tell, Meg never sleeps. So he actually has, he's got, he's got a beeper on his mobile phone so that he gets alerts from servers when he's asleep, I don't know how his wife puts up with it, but <laughs> 30 seconds later, he's there. <laughs> yeah. How scalable is the model? 20, 30 people? <laughs> yeah, scalability is a good, uh, it, I think it's an interesting question. The, before we put the systems in place, the kind of rigidity, we would have probably said, this is perhaps not that scalable. But now, uh, I'm much more optimistic that uh, this is scalable by, and in fact, I almost think uh, we're sm uh, 14 people were below where we should be. I think we would, should really be around about 25, 30. What we would do to achieve it is you need to basically be ready to do a lot of delegating. So currently, uh, 
So you, you were basically going to take your senior developers and they're going to have to develop as you know, managers of areas of work as well. But normally, uh, I mean, if they're working in a team, uh, I might barely communicate in terms of directly, intensively with, say, four people for a month. Don't, they don't need to. They're, they're pretty self-managing uh, within that agile, agile model. But you would, you do start to generate things around HR and pay and uh, uh, general management stuff. So you would need to, I think this idea of developing you know, semi-autonomous units would be the way to scale it. Yeah. Does it give you any problems or challenges with clients who might want to come to your office, meet your team, and you know, be, be there for collaborative meetings and stuff like that? Or um, do you find most clients are able to work in the same way with video conferencing and those type of tools? You do, you definitely have a perception, you can have a perception problem at the beginning with clients, which is one of the reasons why we've been really, we're so, you know, our sales uh, approach would be very much about, well, we have all these systems in place uh, to address this issue, but you have to address it proactively mm -hmm. with clients by simply going right there and saying, this is how we work. Uh, we haven't... Uh, we haven't encountered a huge number of problems once past that that initial thing, but the thing is that if you're what you're actually saying is we only work agile, then oddly it takes away quite a lot of this because uh, it might sound a bit cheeky, but we're hiring the client in a sense. We're saying if you're capable of working in an agile way, uh, then uh, in that case we will be able to work with you. Uh, so it, it kind of spins it around. Right, yeah. yeah, it spins it around a bit. That, uh, uh, in, but yeah, you, you you have got a slight. So we do have a business office, a bit, you know, like one of these. Uh, it's not a co-working space with the, that we have in London, and we have met clients in there if they just want to meet for meetings. So it's also amazing how often they never even ask. And it's only later on they think, oh, right, you work like that. And once they got going. Yeah. I was just wondering what happens when things kind of are going a bit wrong. You know, there's problems with websites or whatever and stuff like that. Are the edges slightly blurred with people's, because everyone's remote, can you just call anybody at any time of day or what happens? Uh, yeah, well, there's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of things in there. Again, in terms of things going wrong, what you're hoping is that the way that you apply Agile is, is addressing, addressing that if the, if the project's spinning off. If... What, there is a, a problem that we've wrestled with quite a bit, is how we handle support. And the, the problem is this, that essentially, if you're doing development, it's, it doesn't fit with doing other things really well. It doesn't fit with having a life. <laughs> so, it, if you support, it's very difficult. So that's really difficult, because if a developer would say, I don't want to get my head up and go and get my head into that and think about it. So how we handle that now is that we... We've got this Redmond ticketing system. The clients will raise tickets in the system. They, they just email to it, which is one of the reasons we use it. One of the reasons we had to abandon using Atrium. We tried open Atrium, but the email communication just didn't seem to work right. Uh, and then the, the system administrator, uh, basically what we do is each of us, uh, or there'll be two members of staff who are responsible for any given project that we support. So if you get a particular site that we support, there'll be two developers, and there the system administrator put in every morning posts all the support tickets that we've got. Uh, obviously, we do great work, so there aren't many of them. But <laughs> all the support tickets we've got in IRC, and then we all look at them and think, oh, right, that's our site. And then your job is not necessarily to do it, but to, if you like, triage it and say, right, oh, that's trivial. I can do it, or that's huge. I can't. It's a feature request, and we're not. We, we can't do it, or it's going to take a couple of hours, and I'm not. I can't do it. So they tell the project manager, and the project manager then finds the per, you know somebody who can drop onto that task. Yeah, I was wondering whether you might just have because you said about the role, the role swapping. Yeah. Whereas you might just assign two people today. You ask the support. So it's your responsibility to work through this. Queue. We've tried support. We've tried various methods, such as such as doing that, uh, and on the whole, people go crazy. They they go crazy. 
Uh, uh, so they all hate support so much. <laughs> so we, 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 so in, in fact, we kind of find it works. But the, the usually is there will be a, like a floating, floating resource. But the key thing is is who's going to take responsibility for all this stuff. Uh, so we try to make sure people are responsible for their own particular, you know, for named projects. They might not be projects they ever even worked on. Uh, but, but yeah, we 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 find that. Actually, dropping people on support is yeah, a recipe for losing staff. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, is it, are we a bit done now? Just, um, you talked about your uh, your daily method of operation and the mm. starting of the daily school and so on. And you made made reference to the sales group. Yeah. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how how that works and um, you know in a, in a team of developers, where does the the sales role come in really? Uh, well, we, we started having a sales group because we decided that <coughs> the idea of well, that the developers develop and the managers manage means you're losing an awful lot of creative thinking. Uh, and uh, you're also limiting the number of people who are thinking about this stuff. Uh, so when we decided to do it, I just put out an invite saying, anybody in the team fancy being in a sales group, which I thought they would just ignore. I think, Why am I going to do that? And Virtually every single member of the team said, yeah, I'll do it. Because actually, people, the assumption that developers aren't interested in it, they, yeah, sure they're interested in it. They, they feel they, they, want, they want to make sure their lousy managers don't screw it up and make, put them out of a job. So they're going to come and take part. So they basically, we, we basically sales have people working on a particular project. So sales is central at a time. We might have a very quick meet, and they'll say, "I'm doing this, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing that," and then people will get on and do that sales stuff. Uh, the other thing we do, just in terms of which I forgot to mention, just in terms of the weekly work, is we never work on client work on Fridays because uh, that's golf day. No, because <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's the day we we make that division and we tell the clients we won't be doing it because on that day we tidy Friday. Go on up, do your security patches and all, you know your module updates, and work on your inter the internal company projects. So yeah, quite rigid time delineation. Okay. Have you guys actually worked with any external third parties that the clients actually asked you to work with them? And if so, how difficult is it to say stitch in an external designer with this entire process? I mean, do you essentially have right? Here's the code enigma manual. Read that. Come back to us. This is how we do it. Or have you had any problems with that? Uh, you should ask me next week. <laughs> we're doing it. We're doing it right now uh, with uh, on a project with a design company, and they're very much in the world of uh, media, uh, you know, ad agency, graphic design type stuff. Uh, and it will be quite interesting to see. Uh, th they're really interested in how our stuff works because they get that. Developers hate design agencies, and design agents hate development <laughs> agencies. And they, yeah, we both re we just say there is an inherent tension in here. Mm. So we'll work. But in terms of bringing people in, they just take part in our system, so that's fine. And they seem very comfortable with it. So they'll just take part in the in the morning scrum meetings on the project and take part in. And yeah. Did you have formal briefing process, or is that maybe something to come later? <coughs> We do actually. So at the beginning of a project, we would actually we would actually go through the agile process and say this is how this works, okay. and, the, and this is how, how, how we do this. So uh, you know, client, you have to you have to write these user stories. Yes, you you the client, you have to do this yourself, uh, and then the client sends the user stories, and I can send them back and say not good enough. <laughs> We're not starting work yet. So uh, it's it really is very kind of rigorous. I guess there's a follow on for that. It's a very cheeky request, but I'm guessing there's an awful lot of material that you can at least point people to that you guys have found very useful in terms of briefing external parties. Do you think you could make you know, a list of resources accessible? Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I will. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, just e email me. Um, Fantastic. Thank okay. you. Yeah, certainly. Well, happy to. Uh, we should probably wrap it there because what's happening?